I want to welcome Josh the show. Thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. I'm a big fan of your work professionally and personally. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'm actually a fan of your work too. Your bio is, is very in-depth. I was awed by it. I mean, I have heard about you and I've read about you, but didn't realize how much work you've done. And you're a perfect person to bring on because I wanted to dive deeper into health anxiety and also just how somatic issues, physical issues, like impact our kids. Because if you're raising a child with anxiety, it would be, I would be surprised if that's not an issue in your house. But before we get into it, could you just tell people a little bit more about you and what you do? Sure. Um, I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm a clinical psychologist. I'm board certified in cognitive and behavioral therapy. Um, and I oversee a team of eight anxiety specialists here in Atlanta. We're in a private practice in the suburbs, north suburbs of Atlanta. And our team spends all week treating kids as young as two to three, usually with SM at that, at that age, um, uh, through adults all the way up through the lifespan, treating anxiety disorders. So we treat some of the co-occurring issues like depression and some eating and body issues, um, family and relationship issues. But the majority of the people we see here, kids, teens, and adults, couples, families, and individuals, we're spending a lot of our time doing exposure-based therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, and helping people face their fears. Yeah, and it's great that you see kids that young. I find that that's, it's hard enough to find an anxiety and OCD specialist, and then people that I talk to run into the other issue of finding someone who will see someone who's under six. So Atlanta's it's, lucky. It's a, yeah, it's a big challenge. So in Atlanta, and probably no different than most major cities, there's two or three anxiety specialty groups. We happen to be one of those very proud groups. Um, but my experience like yours is similar where a lot of therapists, whether they're master's level, whether they're LPCs, psychologists, I'm a clinical psychologist, go to graduate school and is sort of default into either seeing kids or seeing adults. And that's usually an age concept. So when people come to our practice, we like to say, we're not an age practice, we're a topic practice. We focus on the topic of anxiety. And my experience, even with my own family, is usually when you take your kid to go see a therapist, it's generally a kid practice. And so given the amount of anxiety that's out there, and you and I both know that anxiety is the most prevalent of class of disorders out there, uh, it's a shame that not more adult or young adult anxiety therapists learn how to treat kids because early intervention for us is everything, prevention's everything. You're working with parents and families. Um, it all starts with kids. And even most of the young adults and adults we see would tell us, yeah, I've had anxiety since I was five, six, seven. So it's atypical to see someone with anxiety as an adult. And it's sort of a brand new onset that that's, that's um, possible. But the amount of anxiety in kids, especially today with topics like gun violence and uh, technology addiction and pressures in school, it just seems inconceivable to not be offering those services to kids, but it is difficult to find a good anxiety therapist who sees kids around the country. That's probably not unique to any city. Yeah. And that, that is a shame because you did talk about how, um, you know, if we're proactive and we get them young, then they won't have to have uh, ideally long-term services. So I want to talk about what normally brings people probably to your office and mine a lot of the times is the physical stuff. So yes. You know, they, I'm sure this happens to you probably on a weekly basis where you get a family that comes in and they've already seen maybe the pediatrician or the gastroenterologist, they have ruled out physical, and then they're told to go see a therapist. So I want to talk about health anxiety, which is kind of in and, in and of itself a different type of anxiety, and also how um, anxiety can manifest in a lot of physical symptoms. So what do, what do you normally see around that? So first, I always like to start with the distinction, uh, agnostic to age, but I know we're focusing on kids right now. I like to talk about the difference between things that are medical versus things that are physical. Um, and I talk about this both in my practice. This is anything I would say in, in therapy, or if I was giving a workshop or seminar to parents or kids or to other providers, that I always want to start with getting some sort of medical workup. And I think that's probably pretty common for most therapists. If there's a lot of physical symptoms like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, common GI issues, um, maybe cardiovascular things. We always want to make sure that there's nothing truly medical going on. I think for you and I, I'd assume that probably, you know, I'm making up numbers, but 85 to 90% of the time, it's not a medical issue. Um, but I like to make the distinction with kids that you might have physical symptoms, but that doesn't mean you have medical symptoms. And that might be a, a semantic distinction, but I like to talk about that because as you know, anxiety is such a somatic physical condition 
um, but that doesn't mean it requires medical intervention. And so I often use the example like my, I have a, I'm a 45 year old tall guy who has a bum left knee and that's a true, true story. Mm -hmm. I played basketball. I was a marching band growing up and, um, you know, I exercise here and there, but you know, I sit in a therapy chair all day long. My left knee doesn't get better. And I've had medical workup on that. And any, any orthopedist has said, you know, Josh, your knee is fine, but we know it's swelling. We know it's sore, but there's no real medical intervention for it right now, except, you know, physical therapy, exercise, stretching, and sort of the everyday things. And so that for me is okay. There's clearly something that's not right with the knee, but it doesn't require a notable medical intervention. It requires a lot of prevention and stretching and exercise and the common things that you and I would do. And I, and I find anxiety somatic symptoms very similar where those medical symptoms are really more physical symptoms that get in the way of feeling good. And for a lot of people who have anxiety, when you don't feel good, that must mean something's wrong. And when something's wrong, our alarm goes off. When our alarm goes off, we get anxiety and then the cycle perpetuates. So we do see lots of kids coming in with tummy issues and headaches and they're feeling a little bit weird or lightheaded or fuzzy. And again, assuming that nothing medical is going on, we start doing some basic education on what physical symptoms are of anxiety. Unlike a lot of adults and young adults, I think a lot of kids don't even know that information and just educating them on the basics of how the mind and body are connected and what anxiety does to you for some kids is its own therapy. That, that education early on is life-changing for a lot of kids. They go, wait, wait, I, wait, I, my brain is making my heart go fat. My brain is why my tummy doesn't hurt. I mean, when I go into fight, flight, or freeze, that's why my, my stomach feels yucky. So if I can stop fight, fight, or freeze, I don't have to take medicine or see a therapist. I'll do that. And so, and so <laughs> like, it, it's just, me up. yes. So it's just, we talk about like, gosh, I wish I had that magic wand or that pill. Our magic wand and pill sometimes is just basic education about how the body is very responsive to stress and anxiety. And if you can find a way to accept that and find ways to nurture and take care of the body and reduce that, um, sometimes all the things that you and I would normally do in therapy aren't even that necessary. If you can sort of maintain sort of a more healthier, balanced uh, body life system. Yeah. And I love that because I think education is, is such a therapeutic approach. And I love that you, you help them understand how their mind and body are connected because I have seen that too, even with my own kids where, you know, my, my youngest has emetophobia, the fear of throwing up and she does, I did rule out medical. And I think it was a good, another really good point is um, you know, I dragged all three of my kids to the doctor, you know, to rule out yeah. medical and all three of them had medical issues. <laughs> so like That was, you. Just, I'm one of the 20%. So you yes. just don't know. They were all issues that can coincide with anxiety. Sure. Um, so she has celiac. So her stomach does hurt a lot. I thought she just had anxiety. So that was eye opening. But her just realizing, yeah, your worry cloud can create your stomach pain. And we're just going to sit with that you know, there's nothing medically wrong with you, like you said, but I think also that it, it is a real pain, you know, that the pain is real, but that you don't have to worry about it. I love that you explained that because I, I think you have to start there because I think a lot of us as parents, I, I'm, as you know, I'm, I'm a parent of two awesome kids. Um, and one of them has been battling anxiety on and off for years. So I'm the parent of an anxious kid. And I'm also a therapist who sees kids and she's on her days where she's using, for us, we're cognitive behavioral specialists and she sees a cognitive behavioral specialist. When she's using those skills, you know, I, she's a superstar. And on days where she struggles to use those, like everyone, kids, teens, and adults, she struggles. And so she also struggles with emetophobia and um, some health anxiety things. So when you start seeing a child go into that tailspin of medical, it really helps to step back and say, well, I know something's physically not right. We're not going to dispute that. But assuming that your pediatrician or your other kind of doctors have ruled out that this is a medical issue, what are me and you and mommy going to do about what's physically going on? Because you have to move forward. You have to go to school or go to the sleepover or finish your homework. That education is, for most kids, I think absolutely a starting point. And most of the kids that we see, and I don't think this is unique amongst kids who specialize in seeing, uh, people who specialize in seeing kids with anxiety, they're smart. They love information. Sometimes they use too much information. Sometimes mm -hmm. we're over incorporating the, the information, but that educational piece, drawing it up. I have a, an app that I use, a free app that shows the molecularity and the functionality of the brain. We can spin around to a 3D model of a brain and showing kids where the amygdala is. And those two little dots are about the size of the pinky tip control all the emotions in the center of the brain. And, and those two little things are controlling when you're happy and sad and, and, and nervous and embarrassed and shamed. And, and you can tweak that a little bit. And when, when you make that change, your body feels better. That's mind blowing. But when you exercise, you feel better. 
When someone says hello to you and you have a good day, you feel better. So there are ways to physically feel better without taking a pill, without doing anything medical. And I think that concept for some kids is lost or doesn't get educated on. And it's just a, such a basic starting point for any kid of any kind of anxiety background. Yeah. Empowerment is so key and letting them Absolutely. know that they have the power to change their brain oh, to get that app. That sounds very cool. It's a cool one. Yeah. Visuals are so important. I think when you're teaching kids um, to get them, to get them motivated. And also sometimes I think educating the parents and how they respond, because I know with both of us have kids with the metaphobia, it's very triggering it when is. you're, when your child's not doing well and they start to panic and how do you work with a parent to kind of be that anchor so that they're there for their child? So we have sort of this two-pronged bifurcated approach that I think most, um, most good anxiety specialists who see kids work on. And that is that balance between family accommodations and being supporting and loving as a parent. Um, family accommodations or FA, just the acronym that a lot of therapists use, is the concept of us as parents getting too involved in our child's needs. Um, dare I say the word enabling? I don't think that's the right word. I often tell parents that you're not the problem, you're the solution. I like so that. sometimes, yeah, parents come in saying, what am I doing wrong? How have I messed this up? What have I done to mess up my kid? And it's like, you haven't done anything to mess up your kid. And if we tweak a few things, you're the one that's going to actually help your child thrive. Yeah. And sometimes that involves stepping back, which is where we start reducing some of those family accommodations of answering questions or taking to the doctor every time they spike a, a small fever or giving them Advil or Tonal every time they say, I need a pill um, or checking their throat or going online to see their symptoms or in other cases, you know, showing them the weather app or whatever their fear is. <laughs> sometimes we as parents just want to give them that information just to calm them down. But you and I know often when people seek out that information to confirm that bias of fear, whether the information is right or wrong, it doesn't end the fear cycle. So I'm often educating parents of A, how do we step back and give our kids some space, um, create some distance between us and the child so the child can create some space between them and their worries, whether in my practice we talk about worry monsters and worry bullies and how to use language for the child to separate him or herself from those worries, which I know you've done in a lot of your podcasts with red and green thoughts, which I absolutely love and how you're building your snowballs. Um, so I think that's across a lot of the pediatric good anxiety books is if we're teaching a child how to separate from their worries, I think we have the same obligation to teach our parents how to separate from their child when they're worrying, not so the child suffers and not so you're neglecting your child because this is not about child neglect, but there are times to intervene and there are times then that when there's where you don't need to intervene. And so if you can step back and watch your child struggle a little bit and your child has the proper skills, it then begs the question, when do you jump in and support your child, praise them, give them feedback that's constructive, give them a reward, dangle the carrot in front of them, and I think with every family, it's different. But the first step, I think, is helping the parent understand how involved are you in that cycle of anxiety of child worries, child does something to manage the anxiety, parent does something to help the child manage the anxiety. Everybody feels better initially, and then we're all stuck because it starts all over. And that circular loop is common for anyone who is loving, caring someone uh, who's anxious, whether it's a husband to a wife or a parent to a child, that loop is vicious. And to pull yourself out of that loop step back and watch and figure out when do I intervene? How do I intervene? Not with their anxiety, but to help them and support them and encourage them. Um, there's an art and science to that, Natasha, but that is really where I think the biggest work for us is working with parents of kids. It's a lot of work I'll be doing in the coming months of putting on some parenting seminars and workshops to help parents better understand when to get involved and really when to step back. And then, and then support the parents because it, it feels terrible as a parent to watch a child struggle and, and suffer and do nothing. But sometimes, as you know, it's actually one of the most healthier, cathartic things to do. So the child learns distress tolerance, a skill that is uh, paramount in beating anxiety. Yeah. And a lot of times when you get into that loop, like you're talking about, then you have those issues like separation anxiety, because mm -hmm. now you're going to be able to fix it for me. So we started off talking about just somatic issues, like how anxiety can just show up physically. And yep. then... Um, I want to move into kind of what you've been talking about now, which is just health anxiety, like being afraid of having a disease, you know, having a sickness. Um, I think health anxiety and metaphobia kind of overlap uh, when it comes to the fear of throwing up. And I feel like that anxiety more than any other anxiety can suck parents in because you have to like differentiate what is real 
you know, or I, real is the wrong word. Like what's medical versus what's anxiety induced when you're medical child thinks, versus physical, that, that, right. de that designation removes all the stigma, oh, I like all that. the shaming, all the blaming. It, it makes it easy where, cause if it's medical, you and I both know, oh my goodness, we're taking you to the ER or the pediatrician or taking your temperature. When I believe it's medical, which we're not always right, you and I both know what to do, but when it's physical, we're stuck. Like, do we get involved? Do we not? Do we talk about it? Do we not? Do we right. teach them skills? That, that distinction for us really eliminates a lot of that sort of blaming or shaming about you making up or fabricating symptoms. Because even if they're fabricating them, they're still physical, not medical. And you and I know there's interventions to support people with physical symptoms. Yeah, I love that. I'm going to totally steal that. Medical versus physical. I like that. It does get rid of all the, you know, heaviness around it. And I do feel like it's important, like one of the first things I do in my practice, I'm sure you do too, is letting the child know that we, we believe them, you know, that you're, what you're yes. experiencing physically, we believe. So when parents um, inadvertently say things like it's in your head and they're not trying to be mean or devalue their pain, they're trying to say like it's psychological, kids think that, um, you know, that they're making it up. And some parents actually do think that, that, you know, it's in your probably head. Probably so. So, you know, sometimes that's the first step, but then how, what should, let's talk about the things that you were talking about before, as far as the, the loop, when should a parent pull back and when should they, let's talk about what their role should be. Sure. When your child feels like they have a fever or they have this lump and they think it's cancer, it's hard. So I, I and I love that you brought up the cancer one because whether it's cancer or we, we you know, Ebola yeah. Um, other, other horrible diseases that some kids don't even know what they are. Again, kids can only fabricate diseases that they've heard of. Most kids right. have not heard of Ebola, so not going to think they have Ebola or some sort of other horrible disease, but most people know cancer. Um, I think when we start talking about helping the parent and the child sort of create these distinctions between medical versus physical, and then we're just going to, I'm just going to jump over to physical because if it's medical, you're going to need to have a different podcast. You yeah. need to have a physician on this podcast right. saying, my goodness, if your child's having a clear, a clear medical outbreak, here's a medical protocol. I don't want to get into that. I'm not a medical provider, but you and I as parents, as lay consumers of anxiety and medical information know, if I genuinely believe my child is in a medical crisis, I'm going to take medically appropriate steps. Yeah. So setting that to the side, it gets kind of fun and funny when we start talking about like flu, tummy bugs, diarrhea versus cancer. And I'm going with the working assumption that most kids that I see don't have cancer. Now, sadly, and to be a, more, a bit more direct, I do tell kids and parents this, and I get this like big wide eyes, Dr. Josh, why did you just tell us this? <laughs> but about 30 to 40% of the population at some point in their lives is going to get cancer. Doesn't yeah, mean it's going to be high. deadly. Yeah, it's, it's high. Um, and every person has cancer cells. Tell that to a child who has health anxiety and they might run out of your office. <laughs> but I like to I, I talk about education without doing scare tactics or flooding or overwhelming people. That education is important because the second you start teaching people that you already have cancer cells, which doesn't mean you have cancer. Again, medical versus physical. You already have parts of your body that are designed to have boo-boos and to feel well and not feel well and that a certain segment of the population is gonna get cancer, that's not the direction I wanna go with parents and families, but you are highlighting that there are real medical conditions out there that we need to pay attention to. But statistically, the majority of the kids that you and I see will never have cancer in childhood, statistically. And, but over the course of their lifespan, unfortunately, about 35% will at some point get cancer. I'm not leaning, I'm, not, I'm starting with that, Natasha, in my first session or two, but, but we are educating about those topics. The question you're asking is, is, you know, how do you get involved and how do you intervene? When we're talking about the cancer topics and the heavy, serious topics, I think it's an easier one for us to take a look at and think about the data, the science, talking down your worry monster, creating that space, working on sort of the green thoughts and the red thoughts, because there are some tried and true indicators of someone has cancer. There are blood tests and there are physical symptoms that a lot of people would probably be assuming um, lumps or bumps or certain things. Um, and I think when kids are not evidencing those specifically, most parents are assuming, and we might be wrong on occasion, but most parents are assuming it's not cancer. But the more insidious ones are like, do you have the flu or strep? Or like, what if I throw up later? What if, what if someone throws up near, near me? So what if every day more benign medical symptoms show up and I won't be able to handle that? And I think that's probably the more um, frequent occurring one, which is what if I don't feel well? What if I get sick? What if I have a panic attack, which I know is not real uh, you know, somatic, but what if I physically or emotionally feel so out of control or ill that I can't handle it and what am I supposed to do? 
And that's where you and I first need to start talking about the locations for which that most often happens. So I think our first step is to help parents and kids identify this concept of, um, other people use the word contamination. And I have to be careful how I use that um, with you. Uh, I, I think you and I know that concept in OCD. You mm-hmm. want to talk about like germ contamination and germs and yuckies and stuff in their hands and not wanting to get sick. But a lot of us talk about contamination like places, people, things are contaminated. So I'm seeing a family right now of an amazing uh, teenage girl who has been out of school for about three and a half months. She has the capacity to go to school, I believe. She's keeping up with her classes online and doing a masterful job. But right now, school is contaminated. Not gross or yucky like OCD, but it's a place where she is fearful that something bad is going to happen. And therefore, she doesn't believe that she can go. And in this case, she's fearful that she's going to get sick. So we're Mm -hmm. back to this sort of health and tummy and somatic issue. And so we've got to find a way to deconstruct why school is a contaminated location. How do we start finding other locations that she feels nervous and sick about that we can start going to? assuming she has coping skills and slowly build up this almost psychological immune system where she can break the barriers of that location. Let's call it a Dunkin' Donuts or a coffee shop where she's feeling panicky, but there's less social pressures and she's not without mom and dad. Mm -hmm. So we then work up to maybe drive into the parking lot of the school and hanging out there without any obligation going in and then going home with the potential of then going to school, maybe then going into school and seeing the administrators, then leaving again. And so sort of in this stepwise hierarchical fashion, which we'd call exposure therapy, identifying a person, a place or thing that creates that bodily symptom, that fear. In this case, it's a fear of getting sick and slowly working up a fear ladder or hierarchy to get someone to overcome that. And that's a parent-child working together, working together to understand what triggers or what cues are making me most likely to be fearful of getting sick. So I think our first step and what I like to do with most families, if I had a you know sketch pad here, is I like to come up with three columns and I teach parents and kids of all kinds, of all backgrounds, T, F, and S, B. So I'm not sure how the camera's operating this, but T is my first column. F is my middle column and S, B is my last column. Any kid I see, my two children my, and my family are no different. And any kid I see here knows S, Bs. And S, Bs for me are safety behaviors. So in OCD, we call them rituals or compulsions. With certain conditions, we'll call it avoidance. But essentially anything someone does to make yucky or make anxiety go away. So the first steps for me with a parent and child, once we all agree that this is not medical, it's physical, is to figure out what are the T's, what are the triggers, what are the people, places, and things that are contaminated that freak you out? What are the fears, the F's that you have? And so if it was OCD, I'd call it an obsession, but in this case, separation anxiety, emetophobia, fear of dogs, snakes, poo-poo, pee-pee, needles, blood, you name it. What are the fears that you have? I'm afraid it's going to hurt. I'm afraid I'll lose my mind. I'm afraid I'll get embarrassed. I'm afraid I'll throw up. I'm afraid someone will see me throw up. I'm afraid I'll, you know, get someone else sick, whatever that fear is. And and we chunk those. That's important information because that's for you and I. Ultimately, we're going to be teaching parents and kids. We've got to encroach that trigger, encroach that contaminated thing, and bring that fear to light somehow. You and I call that exposure therapy. Um, But ultimately, for you and I, I tell kids, this is one of the most evil things I say. I say, I don't care about your emotions. I say, hashtag JK here. Hold on one second. (laughs) I do care about your emotions because I don't want you to feel sad and angry and upset. I really don't. But at the end of the day, if I don't care about your emotions and you stop caring so much about your emotions or your physical symptoms, the SBs, the safety behaviors, the things that you do to stay safe when you're not in danger are the things we need to change. And we start teaching kids the math and puzzle behind this algorithm of triggers, fears, and safety behaviors. Parents step back and go, oh my goodness, I've been working so hard to help my child feel less fearful, feel less scared, and really, I've been putting out the wrong fire. I need to teach my child how to not do these safety behaviors or rituals or avoidant actions. Sometimes they're behavioral, and we can see them on camera. As you know, sometimes they're up here. Sometimes they're mental mental rituals or mental activities we do up here. I've got to teach my child how to stop doing those safety behaviors and find ways to face their fear sit with that discomfort and stay present. And there's a bunch of skills you've teach in your YouTube videos and online that I love to teach children how to talk back or um, how to do some guided imagery or other techniques you offer for when someone is either in the throes of anxiety or afterwards, how to get back to a state of normalcy. But for me, it all starts with, let's focus less on the triggers, the contaminated places, people or things, and the fears, and teach people what all the safety behaviors are 
and find ways to start changing them or reducing them. And for me, we start seeing some magic because if you can get rid of those safety behaviors, which is the hardest thing in the world that you and I ask our kids, both in practice and our families to do, then they're there stuck sitting with anxiety, which is what they ultimately dread. And to get them there is, you know, the whole task of therapy. It's the most important functioning goal. And once they stop, start giving up those safety behaviors and they're still not in danger, they can see some real change. And that's a hard place to get to, but I'd, I'd ask any parent to think about what are the litany of safety behaviors that your family does, you to child and child to him or herself. And if you can identify them, isolate them, reduce them, and ask for a different replacement behavior, you've struck gold. But that's what makes therapy so fascinating, so exciting, and sometimes so hard. I love the visual. You know, I think that's just such a great visual to do those three columns and really just spell it out. So this might be eye-opening to some parents who, who really have not heard about this. They don't realize that there are safety behaviors. They don't realize that trying to fix the problem is growing the problem. You know, so I think a lot of times parents get stuck with, and I, I know you see this too, you know, let's fix school or let's get you out of school because if school's the problem, we'll just remove that. Or let me just take you to the doctor every time you feel sick so that you can get that confirmation you're feeling better. So, and that, that obviously grows the anxiety, although it's counterintuitive to, I think, what um, a parent would think. So Counter, see- counterintuitive, I, I like you, first of all, it's completely counterintuitive, counterintuitive to your and my core as parents who hopefully love our children and care for our children it is the hardest thing in the world to do to say, I'm not going to answer that question. I'm not going to go online and check your symptoms. We are not calling the doctor because you and I both know more times than not what happens next the child escalates. And if we stand our ground, what happens next? The child escalates. Until you have this extinction burst where they're threatening life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, they swear that this is the worst one ever. This is the real one. This is the Titanic. This is the volcano. You don't get it, mom. Your mom, dad, you don't. This is the, I'm not joking. I'm not lying. And you think I'm faking it. Take me to the doctor. And if you stand your ground, you and I run the risk of meltdowns and anger and aggression, which I know you talk about in a lot of your videos, which is crucial because I like to educate parents that I believe that anger and aggression in anxious kids, and I know it can happen in lots of other kids, is a natural byproduct of you and I being healthy, setting limits to the child's anxiety because anger and aggression is, is when most of us honestly back down, whether it's sleep time activities or food activities or hygiene. When the child starts to threaten, I'm going to run away. I'm, I'm going to jump out the window. I'll get a knife. When they, when they threaten those things, our ears perk up, our hearts start racing. We go, oh my, okay, stop, 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 stop. I, fine, fine, fine. You win. Yeah. But, and I'm hoping in most cases, and again, I'm not trying to play with safety here. That's an extinction burst. That is their anxiety threatening the loudest and most aggressive possible thing because they genuinely believe that you don't believe it. And the reality is we probably do believe it, but intervening is not the solution. It ultimately comes a gigantic SB, a gigantic safety behavior. And so sometimes it does require a parent to sit there and weather that storm, which is one of the hardest things you and I as parents have to do. It's why I also believe we should be doing much more parent work with anxious kids, not just working with the child. And whether it's the parent, the grandparent, the counselor, the school coach, whoever the parent and caregiver structures are, teaching them that it's okay not giving your child's anxiety, but it's also um, okay to reward it when your child's doing well and, and praise your child when they're trying to figure it out or when they're struggling. But to give into that moment, as you alluded to in that circle, it just perpetuates this beast. So it's very paradoxical. I love that phrase. It's a good 50 cent word to give to kids, but it is, it's counterintuitive. We ask kids, hey, if you're at the dog park and you see a scary gangly dog <sighs> off leash, getting ready to attack you and mom and dad are far away and the dog's off leash, you see no one else, what do you do? And what's the kids say? Oh my God, you run away. You don't run away because unless it's like a little teacup terrier or a chihuahua, <laughs> you, you and I and a kid are never going to outrun a dog, not a golden retriever, not a pit bull, not a German shepherd, not a labradoodle, you know, and, and the labradoodles and the cockapoos, all that. we're never going to outrun a dog. So the dog's going to attack us and bite us. You don't outrun the dog. So now standing there, encroaching it, staring it down, that's scary, but it gives you the best chance to fight it off as well as scream and call for help and do all those things. But if you turn your back and run, which is what feels like the right thing to do when the dog's going to chase you, you and I both know the dog's going to get you. And though I'm in Atlanta and you're on the, you're on the West Coast, you're in Arizona, um, we don't experience a lot of snow. Those who are from the Northeast know that when you're driving in snow and ice and your car starts skidding, the natural instinct is to turn the wheel the other direction, which will have the car spin out. 
And for anyone who's really been trained, you turn your wheel toward the direction of the spin so your wheels gain traction. Again, very paradoxical, very yeah. counterintuitive, but that's the appropriate thing to do when danger is facing you. You turn towards the danger. But in our world, Natasha, you and I know we're not talking about danger. We're talking about scary. So in addition to medical versus physical, I like to teach kids the difference between scary safe and scary danger. And as I tell people in my practice, I don't do scary danger. I don't want to go to jail. I'm not looking to get a lawyer. I like to go home and see my wife and kids at night. <laughs> I don't do scary danger. So we have needles and blood and poop and, and throw up. We have jars of throat care and bats and spiders and all the stuff we have here. I don't put kids in danger. I don't try and put people in danger. Though on occasion, danger can come our way. It's accidental and unplanned. You and I are trying to address scary safe, not scary danger. If it's not medical, and I'm not dealing with something that, that has a high likelihood of something bad happening, I'm trying to help someone in the face of scary, but not dangerous. What are your coping techniques? Because if it's danger, you and I should call the cops, run away, you know, hide and duck. But that's in an anxiety world, that's avoidant. That's a safety behavior. And it keeps that circle or that loop stuck. And that's where we get trapped. Okay. I love that dog analogy. I'm going to have to. Oh, take it's great. <laughs> yeah. I mean, everything That's we teach in anxiety so is counter, it's counterintuitive. Everything we're asking someone to do is face your fear, go towards the, you know, we talk about you're going towards the fire, but this fire is metaphorical. This yeah. danger is metaphorical. And that's why I emphasize safety behaviors are these funny, hilarious things we do to say safe in scary, safe situations, not scary, dangerous situations. So of course, I'm hoping that you and I are equipping kids, you know, with good touch, bad touch or stranger danger that we teach kids if someone is, is, is being inappropriate, if they feel like they're in danger to call their mom or find an adult or find someone with a, a badge at a store. These are common things we teach kids to do if they feel danger. But I'm hoping that probably 95 to 98% of the kids that you and I see, even if they've had a trauma history, their current fears are not about something happening again a tree falling on a house, a car accident, or other kind of horrible things kids have been through, death or medical illnesses. Those are real scary, traumatic things. But the likelihood of those things happening again are pretty slim. So you and I are not spending our time trying to teach kids about danger. We're trying to teach kids about scary and the way the mind and body react to that, which means we need to empower our parents to think about this is not a danger situation. This is a scary situation, which means we need to eliminate um, safety behaviors because your child is not in danger. So I think that starts with a lot of empowerment towards the parent of it's okay for a child to struggle in a safe moment because them feeling discomforted in a safe moment is proper. It's appropriate. And honestly, it's kind of normal and healthy. Yeah. And using scary safe, I like that for parents too. And I'm glad that you highlighted the reaction that sometimes you can get. Um, I kind of talk about it being like the worry cloud reaction. Like it's not your child when your child is saying, no. I hate you, or this is the real one. A lot of times, even just the emotional kind of uh, hurtful stuff that kids can say when they're not getting those safety behaviors done for them can, can have parents back down. And, you know, I'm sure you get this too. Like I get calls where it's like, this isn't working, Natasha. Why? Well, you know, she said she hated me because I wouldn't take her temperature and you know, she's obviously not better. And so having that understanding of it's going to look ugly before it gets better that that wasn't your daughter, you know, that was, you know, the worry cloud showing up or fighting for its life, whatever analogy you want to use. Yeah. It's good, helpful for parents to, to know that you have to kind of go through it. You can't just keep feeding it. And, and go a step further. I, I, I even tell families in front of the child, because I like to sort of plan for, I already know we're going to be experiencing some at a minimum verbal violence possible physical violence in the context of anxiety. Again, if this is in the context of defiant behavior or other kind of inappropriate behavior, I'm going a different direction. But in the context of anxiety, I believe that conflict in anger is a natural byproduct. And I go a step further and say, conflict is a, is a safety behavior. Con conflict is a byproduct of this anxiety moment because at the end of conflict, there is always, and I ask the kid to fill in the blank. And there's many answers here, but there's always an ending. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's ugly. Sometimes it's a hug. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's an apology. Sometimes you lost your cell phone. There's always a sun setting. And for anyone who has anxiety, all they want is that guarantee, that certainty, that absolution. So conflict guarantees in most households that it will end. Conflict always ends. It doesn't always end well. 
but conflict always ends. And unfortunately for you and I, we're often teaching things with this concept of uncertainty, of not knowing how it's going to end, of not knowing where or what's going to happen. And so conflict by definition is, I think, an action out of anxiety. This is just my own sort of thoughts to myself. I haven't researched this and I don't know if there's a lot of science behind it, but my anecdote experience seeing so many kids when parents come and say, gosh, like when they're in an anxious state, they're not their real selves. It's like this Jekyll and Hyde child. Mm. They're acting like these monsters. And I'd say, well, it's a tough thing to say, but they're worry monsters. Hence monster mm. are acting like these monsters and conflict is just their guaranteed way to either get their way or for everyone to just stop everything or for you to finally take them seriously. Conflict demands a solution which is the ultimate safety behavior, safety behavior ritual because a solution ends everything, which is what picking your skin is or looking up the symptom or asking your mom a thousand questions or checking the weather app or looking to see if there's a dog outside. All of those are to get a final answer of is it or isn't it? And that black and white thinking is at the end of conflict. So conflict for me is just a natural byproduct and not a fun one, as you know, as yeah. a parent, but no. it's a natural byproduct of the, of the peaks of anxiety. But it's for the kid, it's a guaranteed resolution seeker. And unfortunately, I'm trying to teach kids to not find resolution, to find uncertainty, to find gray, to sit with it. And boy, is that difficult to do as a child. And it's difficult for us as parents to sit back and watch our child act in very inappropriate ways, ways in which we didn't raise them and almost be okay with that. Now, we're not really okay with it. You and I both know that, but I'm okay with them um, acting in ways if they believe it's going to get some result. I don't have to give them that result. Right. So back to what we sort of our discussion. That's my apologize for this sort of long, long, um, maybe wrong direction. But no, with good. health anxiety, with emetophobia, um, the end result can be going to the doctor, going to the emergency room, asking for Advil a thousand times, um, asking to have their tummy checked, asking to take their temperature. Um, all these are safety behaviors. Again, I'm getting away from the T's and the F's and I'm mm -hmm. always focusing on those SB's. Yeah. And there's a long list of things that kids will ask us or do to themselves to figure out, are they sick or are they not? Is someone going to throw up or not? It's always fun to be in the car with an emetophobic child when mm -hmm. the other child is gagging or like, you know, taking a gasp and the, you know, the, the hands go on the ears, the child's looking at them. And like, that's a classic safety behavior moment because right. whether my other child throws up or not, your hands on your ears is not going to stop that. In fact, paradoxically, the more you freak out, the more likely the sick person is going to get sicker right. if they're actually sick. And so again, it's another counterintuitive technique, but to sit there and be calm and rational is more likely to make the other person who's choking or gagging to get calm and rational as well. So I'm asking parents to really step back and do a deep dive into what are all the safety behaviors that they're doing with their child or they believe their child's doing. And if it's on uh, emetophobia and health anxiety, there's a pretty clear list out there that most of the good books have about things that we all do to either symptom check or body check, ask, ask experts online or doctors, go online and find information or the most insidious one that you and I probably are the kings and queens of, being asked a million reassurance seeking questions. Yeah. And one of the first things I teach parents literally on day one, I'm not asking for a lot of intervention from kid on day one. I think that's flooding. But on day one, I ask parents when you get a W question, a who, what, where, when, why, or how, which ends in W kind of question. <laughs> Cause it doesn't start with W, but it ends in W. So a W question, your answer, your job is to not answer it, not, not answer it, because I think if you don't answer, I think that's invalidating. Yeah. If you answer it, it's a safety behavior. Right. So I have parents name a country. Hey, hey, mom, what time are you coming home tonight? Um, Honduras. <laughs> like, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm serious. Like, like, are you coming home like eight or nine? Oh, you're serious. I'm sorry. Um, uh, Paraguay. No, 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 no. Seriously, like, I really no. Like, are you coming home like after or later? Like, this, like, is the nanny going to be here or not? Oh, you, oh, okay. I missed your question. Um, uh, Peru. And then you start basically doing what a lot of the interventions do, which is labeling that this is an OCD or anxiety moment. And so I'm using countries, which is educational and mm -hmm. fun and silly, and it keeps your parents on your toes. Yeah. I'm having them name a, a random country. It's as random and, and ridiculous as the questions you and I get about everything a child could possibly want to know right now about the guarantee of when you're going to come home, what time you're picking me up, is this or isn't it? Is my fever high? Does my, is my time, do I need medicine? And those questions, if you answer them, assuming it's not danger and assuming it's not medical is a gigantic safety behavior. And that reassurance seeking, I, I, I hope for any parents out there listening is probably the most difficult one to change. But if you can change that one, you're probably eliminating 50 to 70% of the safety behaviors that kids do who have medical fears, health anxiety, emetophobia, fear of other people getting sick, fear of flu, fear of whatever it is, because most of it is child to parent 
asking them, am I going to be okay in 18,000 different ways. So I like to teach parents right away. Don't engage with their worry monster. Don't answer the question. Don't not answer it, but say some non sequitur and see how funny it gets. And the, the child's going to get angry at you. Just be ready for that. Yeah. If you do it enough times, my, my uh, younger child, I, I now have a 12 year old and a nine year old. My nine year old can now ra name a random country when my daughter um, throws one of those questions out. It's just great to see the whole family gets involved in <laughs> sort of this escapades of naming countries. So it's fun, that but funny. it's an I easy like skill it. to do. I like and that. it teaches kids geography, which is not a yeah. bad thing to do. Yeah. It's a bonus for sure. Major I bonus. think parents are going to get some really good messages from this episode about some things that are probably counterintuitive that they have never heard before, especially if they're not in treatment, you know, that, um, those questions are safety behaviors. You know, mom, am I going to throw up today? Mom, um, do you think I'm going to catch that? This boy was sick, you know, and I, I think parents, you know, in general, unless they're in treatment with a good provider, they don't know that that's actually completing that loop and, and kind of growing the anxiety. And I like, I like your approaches and teaching kids too, like, Hey, that's going to grow your worry monster. And, yes. and so I'm not going to talk to your worry monster anymore. I mean, my daughter knows the one with the metaphobia. She knows that if she asks me, um, am I, am I going to throw up? She knows my answer is always going to be, maybe, do you want me to get you a bucket? You know, and that's first, a great answer. <laughs> I know. Yeah. If we have a bucket, I have a bucket in my purse. Like, you know, I just always, not in my purse. I have a bag in my purse because I'm always like, if you do, you know, you can go yes, to the if it's a medical condition, we got a bag to puke in. And if you don't, I'm not going to answer it. So it's right. a win-win for you, the parent. The hard part with her is because she has celiac, um, she does sometimes throw up because sometimes it's her, her, her stomach and not her anxiety, but she's gotten so good at differentiating that she'll even say, if we're going to a party and she has social anxiety, she'll say, uh, I'm having a stomach ache, but I know this is my, this is my fear. Do you think I'll throw up? You might. You know, and there we are. The fact that she can differentiate that is pretty fantastic. I mean, I think, I think that's ultimately the goal because I, I have no doubt that there's times when I've told my daughter, you know what, you know, uh, dad, you know, I don't feel well, something bad can happen. And my response is something like yours. I'll sometimes go like to habanero ghost pepper level with her. I won't do it with yeah. my own therapy kids, but I'll say, you know, sweetie, uh, you're, you know, you're probably gonna die in the next few days. And if you do, I'll make sure there's lots of people at your funeral. Um, <laughs> and I, I just, now I don't recommend parents doing that, but I'm the parent of the anxious child. So I can do that yeah. to my own child. We do that um, but, but like you, I use a lot of, we, my wife and I use a lot of uncertainty kind of phrases and, and principles of, you know, what time are you guys coming home? My response is, you know, maybe never, I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> there's a chance we pull an all nighter. We'll see what happens. Um, so I will sometimes go to the macabre with my daughter, but you can only play that a few times, but the ability to distinguish uh, for the child to distinguish, listen, dad, like I really don't feel well. It's a tough one. Cause sometimes my daughter genuinely doesn't feel well. And I sadly probably more often take a more conservative approach of getting involved. And I will lean more towards, I'm assuming it's an anxiety symptom. Um, there's literature out there in the OCD community of, if you believe it's a symptom, treat it like a symptom. And what's a shame is that sometimes, Natasha, you and I are wrong, and it can be in those invalidating moments. And so it becomes the boy who cried wolf kind of syndrome. We are overcautious to get involved as parents, and I educate parents through that, that we're sometimes overcorrecting in the wrong direction. So I don't want parents to be neglectful or feel like they can't take anything seriously. And to me, besides the treatment of these anxiety conditions and symptom reduction and learning to live with uncertainty, I think the byproduct of anxiety in childhood is the degradation or the erosion of the relationship between child to parent. And it breaks my heart on those days where my daughter is really a tough child. I love her to death. I, I can almost say I love her more than my son because my son who's super easy and super kind doesn't take much effort and energy. And so if I can love her in, in more ways because she, I wouldn't want to wish her struggles on anybody, but there is at times an erosion between parent to child. And I watch it between her and myself and her and my wife. Um, and my wife and I are best friends and have a package deal. And though she's married to a therapist, we sort of are using the same principles and guidelines. It's really tough to say no to our daughter and it creates major conflict. And I'm hoping through the process of therapy, she has seen a therapist. She's actually using some of your videos and loves your videos as well. Um, yeah, lo love them. And um, so I'm hoping that we can repair some of that broken relationship because I think there have been trust violations, probably her to us and us to her. There have been, you know, the violations of coming to us and talking to us about sort of private things. And we don't want to be the parents who she can't come to, but the problem is most of the things she comes to with us are not really necessary. And so I'd encourage any parent who's not seeing a therapist or any parent in therapy to really think about how do I heal and work on that relationship with my child separate from the anxiety, find those special moments when they're not in the flares of symptoms um, to go ice skating 
to go to Starbucks, to go get an ice cream, to, to go do something sweet, not because we're doing well, but just because, because I really watch as a parent to a child and watching in my own practice here, that breakdown of parent to child. And it's very sad to see it's heart, it's heartbreaking. Um, and it's all because of anxiety. It's not because the parents mean or neglect or dysfunctional, though I'm sure some of the parents that I see have tendencies towards difficult parenting. And it's not because children are bad children. I don't believe are born bad kids, yeah. but anxiety suffocates the family. And as you and I know, if this is OCD and I, I view health anxiety and emetophobia in the OCD spectrum of anxiety disorders. Mm -hmm. And OCD is in the top 10 most debilitating diseases in the world, not, not medical diseases, in the top 10 most debilitating, most impairing, ruining your life kind of diseases. So if it's ruining your life, it's ruining the people that you love as well. And so I'd encourage anyone who loves someone with anxiety, parent to parent, spouse to spouse, parent to child, or even child to parent, to really think about the toll it's taken on your relationship and above and beyond the treatment aspect of anxiety to really think about how do we repair the relationship separately because that relationship is why we're in this together. It's why we love each other. It's why we're willing to put up with some of these shenanigans. And it'd be a shame that after this is all said and done, the, the kid or the, the teenager is feeling better and more in control. And there's still a breakdown in the relationship between parent and child. It's not the parent's fault. It's sure as heck not the child's fault. It's the amygdala. It's the limbic region. It's that little dot in the brain. There's two little dots that are about the size of a, the tip of a, pink, a pinky that are called the amygdala that spray all these juices in these kids brains that make them look like monsters um, and so that's another aspect that i think we often get lost in treatment and lost in a lot of the books i read but when we talk about parenting the anxious kid it's focusing on how do we sort of nurture and um, revalidate that relationship because it's it's tough as you know to love that anxious child in certain moments and um but we still do it yeah and those are good points and um, that relationship does need to be fostered. And I think foster in the right way because um, by giving into them, because sometimes parents will think, you know, I just don't like the negativity and mm -hmm. they can't come and talk to me now. So I'm going to just give into them because my relationship with them is more important. And what I think a lot of times parents don't realize is that that's not the way to build a really healthy relationship. You know, that you have to stand firm, but then celebrate, like celebrate those successes. And then your child, I mean, my kids have had epiphanies where they're like, I get it now, mom, you know, I get why we're having to do these exposures. I get why you torture me and make these funny comments. Like, because I'll highlight, you know, you're going to a party last year. You couldn't do that. Yes. Or you're, you're eating in the cafeteria. Do you remember last year? And kids have amnesia. They like, don't remember, you know, which is great, but they don't remember how far they've come. So I think highlighting it and doing wind journals, I mean, you can do things that are related even to the anxiety to foster the relationship and, and show that it's out of love. That, that this stuff is happening. Uh, I, I love that you acknowledge that kids do have amnesia and, and our brains as gen, in general gravitate towards, you know, the magazines and the grocery store of what everyone, you know, looks better and is having more fun trips and all the Instagrams and Facebook posts are out there, people on ski trips and doing amazing. And our brains naturally go towards the grass is always greener. Um, and we, are, you know, my life's not as good as theirs. And that's just, a, that's just the way in which a lot of brains have been kind of conditioned. And I think kids are no different. They forget their successes and how bad things were. And I think it's important to highlight like things were really bad. Like you were almost like hospital level. And look at the steps you're taking today that you went to the sleepover, that you tried that new food. I mean, trying a new food for some people is, you know, a Saturday and a Sunday, but for some kids trying a new food is a once in a year experience. Oh, totally. Yeah. yeah so uh, those little wins you have to celebrate, have to reward, have to acknowledge, um, and encourage the kids to do it to themselves as well, because yeah, kids easily forget those triumphs and, um, we as parents have to remind them of that. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on. This has oh, been really- pleasure it's been informative for me. I'm like, I'm leaving with some good. I always know when I have someone really good on when I'm like, Oh, I have some good ideas now to apply in my own practice. So I appreciate that. Well, I'll, I'll share with you. Um, so, you know, as a therapist who does this for a living has been doing this for, in this specific capacity, seeing kids this way for about 15 years, I've been doing treatment for 20 years and who runs an anxiety practice in Atlanta that I am super proud of. I have organically grown from just doing it by myself years ago to now having nine amazing clinicians of different backgrounds. Um, as a parent of an anxious child, you are offering, uh, I, I'm going to embarrass you a little bit, probably what I think is the most valuable resource online. There are probably 10 books you and I right now could cite off that any parent could buy and read, get them on Amazon, Barnes Noble almost doesn't exist anymore. Um, there's a few good videos out there, Unstuck, um, which is a great OCD pediatric movie, um, and some other podcasts out there. But I will say without fail, 
that the YouTube channel that you have, both directed at parents and more specifically directed at the kid, um, is probably one of the most valuable resources on the web. It's free to people. You're not asking me to say this. I know you're not. This is what I'm doing because I, as a parent of an anxious kid who's been in therapy, she has taken medication and she is right now living as close to her best life as possible and still has her bumps in the road. We're using your videos now as a supplement and sort of a booster to what we've done in more traditional brick and mortar. And not every parent can either access or afford therapy. Uh, my background plus 20 years is trying to find ways to increase the accessibility and affordability and availability of evidence-based interventions of all kinds. For me, specifically in the anxiety world, and I do a lot of research and technology development in that, your videos, your podcasts, your Facebook channel, uh, your Facebook group is easily for me. And I've mentioned it in other, other podcasts, the most valuable asset right now out there in the cyber world. And any parent who has access to it is lucky. And any parent who doesn't know about this, I don't know how to get the word out, but you're kicking butt out there. And I'm, I'm grateful to be a part of this little um, moment for you, this podcast. Um, my family's grateful for the resources you put out there and my patients use it. So you are doing an amazing job in getting the word out there. And um, I'm really um, appreciative of that. So thank you so much as a professional and as a parent who at home, I don't get to wear the lab coat. So my, my daughter thinks you're cool. You're cooler than I am because you're on YouTube. So um, I, thought that. <laughs> I know, I know the lab coat effect works, but my lab coat at home is just a jacket or a t-shirt. So I know, I know. So I'm, I'm grateful to be a part of this because you are doing truly amazing work. The amount of effort that goes into doing what we do and then taking it online and putting it out there for the consumer um, in the way you've done it, um, it's, it's just, it's mind blowing how much you've done. So kudos to you and please keep doing this. Oh, I really appreciate the kind words. Thank you so much. My Thanks pleasure. for coming on. I appreciate it. Hi, I'm a mom of a daughter with OCD. I live in South Africa um, and it's a country that doesn't have a lot of resources for children's mental health and specifically OCD. I really was at my wit's end on how I'm going to support my child, how I'm going to do ERP, how I'm just basically going to, to parent a daughter with OCD in a country that has little to no resources. And at times it got just debilitating for us as a family and I was super lonely, um, people weren't listening, I didn't have any support. The AT community has been an absolute lifesaver. Natasha has been instrumental in the past few months in helping us set up ERP challenges, going through them step by step, being supportive each and every step of the way. Joining the AT parenting community has been one of the best things I could have done for me and my family. Uh, Natasha has built this community and it is exceptional. I've learned so much. The support is fantastic. It's, it's just been life-changing for my daughter. Um, it's so nice to be able to ask her live questions in office hours. She's there, she responds. Uh, her live videos every week where she asks us what we need her to talk about. Uh, also her forums, again, where you can ask questions. She's on there all the time. She is very present. The resources she has had provided, the worksheets, uh, there are so many things in this AT parenting community that are beneficial. Natasha gives you so much of her time and her expertise. She's there to answer your questions, so it's such a personal way of getting help and support when it's much needed. Personally, the community has helped me because I feel like I needed my support. And then you have the added bonus of this fantastic community of parents who are going through such similar things and suddenly you're empowered and have ways of accessing help and making a real difference to your family. And also just the support of all the other moms and dads. It's really good, you know? We laugh together, we cry together, we fail together, we succeed together, um, and, and everybody gets it. Everybody gets it, and it's such a nice community to be with, and I hope you join us. You won't be disappointed. Try it out.